Hello and welcome to The Enterprising Investor, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and I'm psyched to have Mark Higgins on the show today. Mark is a former investment consultant who published an absolute opus of a book this month, Investing in U.S. Financial History, Understanding the Past to Forecast the Future. You'd think it would be hard to write about 230-odd years of financial markets across nearly 600 pages to make it compelling and interesting. And as a writer, I can tell you, you'd be right. But Mark has done an amazing job of bringing that history to life. There's just so much to cover within our usual 25-ish minute constraints, so I'll dive right in. But first, my thanks to you, Mark, for, for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for those compliments. Uh, that, that means a lot to me. So in order to get a sense of the scope of this undertaking, I, I think it would probably help to describe how you approach the task of breaking down and explaining U.S. financial history back to 1790. So maybe I wonder if you could take us at a high level through the periods or eras that you categorize U.S. financial history into. What, what were they and, and what set each era apart? Yeah, so it really was a bottom-up process. It's not like I chose certain eras to cover. It was really working my way from 1790 all the way to 2023 and really finding inflection, key inflection points that had to do with economic development in the country, the evolution of the financial system, or, or securities markets. So, you know, at a high level, starting in 1790, and the first, there, there are six parts to the book. And the first part is from 1790 to 1865. And it really is the United States experimenting with central banking, experimenting with securities markets, and really developing the industrial infrastructure, the, the early industrial infrastructure of the country. And then it concludes with the Civil War, um, which obviously is important from just the U.S. history perspective, but it was also important in terms of uh, establishing the national banking regime. The second part is called Growth and Grift in the Gilded Age, and it's from 1866 to 1895. And that's really a story of kind of some growing pains for the United States as it really became a formidable industrial competitor in international markets. And the regulatory environment and the behaviors didn't really keep pace with the economic development. So the, there was a lot of shenanigans in securities markets. There, are a lot of, there was a lot of corruption in corporations. And it was, really a, it was really a test of your tolerance for cognitive dissonance. The United States was doing great things and bad things at the same time. The third part is called Growing Pain of an Emerging Empire. And that's from 1896 to 1929. And that is the period where the United States really began to rival the British Empire. Uh, we became, th during the, this 10 year period called the American Commercial Invasion from 1896 to 1906, we really started to replace Britain as the world's workshop. That's what they, that's what they re refer to Britain as in, in the 1800s. And we also began to mature in terms of our financial infrastructure. The panic of 1907 essentially spurred the, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which brought central banking back to the United States. There's a there's very interesting comparables to today with World War I and the Great Influenza. And then the chapter ends after the Roaring Twenties uh, prompted the crash of the stock market in 1929. The fourth part is, is it probably the most important for today, which is the, to understand what's happening today, is the Great Depression and global destabilization. That's from 1930 to 1945. And that really covers the Great Depression and, the, and World War II, which was, people don't often appreciate how much World War II was caused by the Great Depression. And it covers that period. And that has really shaped in a lot of ways the world we know today but a lot of people have forgotten how that came about. The fifth part is called the wealth of the American empire. And this is really covers how the United States replaced Britain as the dominant empire for the world. And it also kind of covers some key international financial infrastructures that were put in place to, with the Bretton Woods agreement. And it finally ends with a period that is very much relevant today which is the great inflation of 1965 to 1982. And some of those lessons, you can see it in the Federal Reserve now, you can see some of the lessons from the great inflation being referenced and to guide their monetary policy today. And then the last part might not be the best title, but I just loved it, was The American Empire Strikes Back. And it was really prompted by after, <laughs> yeah, it's got, it's got some Americana to it, but 
um, it really covers after the great inflation, we had this great period of growth and it begins with the development of the high tech industry in Silicon Valley. And then it goes through some of the developments in the institutional investment plan market, it covers the Yale University endowment and how that spurred a lot more complexity in institutional plans. And then finally, we get to the last 20 years, which covers a, a couple of pretty major crises, the global financial crisis, which everybody's familiar with. And then it ends with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and really ends in kind of March 2023 with the Fed's ongoing battle to contain inflation. And the interesting thing about that last chapter, it that was actually, I mean, there's nothing good about COVID. So don't, you know, this is intellectually, it was interesting, was that going through that, I found myself referencing chapters throughout the book. So, you, you know, the initial panic, well, this was like July 1914 when World War I set in. The post-war inflation after World War I and, and the post-influenza, great influenza inflation, well, that's like what we experienced over the past three years. And it, it was really interesting in that that last capstone chapter was largely just a repetition of, of things that people have already read. So that's the, as quick as I could do it, that's pretty much the summary of there's a lot more to it, obviously. I, I can't hit everything, but that's that's roughly the summary. Yeah, that's it's. I can imagine that. Yeah, as you, as you go through it and you spend that time doing that research, and then reflecting on it, and then getting getting to the getting to the end of that, that you would see some some themes emerge. Yeah, uh, through that process. Can you talk a little bit more about about that? Some of the themes that you saw come out of the research. So, the you know, getting back to just what I was talking about with the COVID nineteen. So what's really interesting is there's kind of that cliche that that history repeats itself, but it doesn't really repeat itself exactly. What it usually is, at least in, in financial terms, it kind of th there are different parallels that explain different things. And I think they, I think they say it rhymes, right? Is that Mark Twain? So yeah, rhymes, say rhymes is probably a better. Yeah. Is a be so looking at COVID nineteen, the relevant parallels that you need to be aware of are July nineteen fourteen the 1919 to 1922 inflation and recession and the, and the Fed's response, understanding what caused the Fed to, what caused the great inflation, the Fed's mistakes, and why they're not going to repeat them uh, by looking at the 1960s and the 1970s. So if, if the more you extend your memory back in time, you'll, you'll see different parallels, but things don't ever really repeat exactly. It's, it's important to be able to recombine them. So that's one theme. The, you know, another theme kind of shifting to more of the professional applications is just appreciating why it is so difficult to outperform markets that, you know, active management, I think people don't, in general, don't realize that how badly the odds are stacked against them in terms of outperforming the market for a long period of time. I mean, there's always a certain percentage of funds that can do it short term. But over a long period of time, it is it is very, very difficult. And that's something that comes out. And you see why active management caught despite that in the book. And there's there's several chapters that, that address that. The last thing, and I actually think this is the most important, it's something that stuck out immediately having started from the 1790 and working my way forward. But the changing perspective on the use of the government debt changed dramatically after World War II. So before uh, before really the Great Depression. So when Alexander Hamilton repaired the finances of the United States in 1790, which is the subject of chapter one, one kind of informal precedent that was established was that the public debt was critical, but it was to be used in times of emergency, mostly foreign war back then. So we ran up debt in the War of 1812, then we paid it down. We ran up debt during the Civil War, paid it down. World War I, paid it down. And then after World War II, that stopped. I mean, it, it, it continued for a little while. For about 10 years, we, we did have some budget surpluses. But we were, in, and I explained this in the book, we were very abnormally wealthy in, late in the late 1940s and 1950s because we had all the world's gold and our industrial infrastructure was intact, whereas the rest of the world was destroyed. And that gave us confidence to spend in ways that in the long term weren't sustainable because the world was going to catch up to us. And not not completely, but they're going you know they're going to rebuild their infrastructure, and that has really continued until today, where that Hamiltonian principle of running up debt in times of emergency and, and then paying it down just stops. So now we just run deficits every year, and that's something that's very 
it, it's clearly unsustainable mathematically. Now it's not going to blow up tomorrow, but 30 years from now at this pace, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't look good. And the, the, the challenge is there's almost nobody alive today that knows what it was like when this country lived within its means. And that's, that's going to be a big challenge to change that mentality back to what it was. Yeah, I want to circle back to, to the comment you're making about active and just this idea that that being able to know when it's different and when it's not different. I feel like that's at the core of a lot of sort of active management wins is when everybody's saying this time it's different. Yeah. Usually it's not. Yeah, that's right? true. And if you can if you can see that if you can see that it's not that different, then you can then you can bet against whatever crazy momentum is going in that direction. Do you, do you think there's something something in that in terms of takeaways from this book as well? I think there's something in that. I just think it's very hard that <laughs> there's this concept of the wisdom of crowds where if everybody has access to the same, let's take a stock price. If everyone has access to the same information, the guess on the appropriate value, individual guesses are going to be all over the place, but the average actually is going to be pretty close to what the actual value is. And to be able to, it's not just being better than average, it's being better than the average of all bets. And it's very hard to do that. And, you know, the experiment that this concept is based on goes back to 1907 in Britain, where you had an ox at a carnival and people guessed the weight of the ox. And I think it's like, it came within like seven pounds or something like that, the average guess. And individual guesses, more than 90% were wrong. So you have to be able to outwit the average, which is pretty good when people have access to the same information. Now, if you have, if you are inside trader or you can manipulate the market, that then that doesn't apply. And that's what they did before 1933 and 1934 with the Securities Act, the 19, the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. It was the, the big stop operators on on Wall Street would manipulate the market and trade on inside information. Once that was outlawed, it became very difficult to outperform the market. It's essentially cheating. Yeah, and I and I guess when you're when you're in these extraordinary situations like, you know, Lehman in 08 or even Silicon Valley last year, it's hard to imagine that that things are going to work out in the end. Although I guess they didn't work out that well for SVB, but having that sense of history that that you know the, yeah. the regulators are not going to allow the banking system to fail at large, that that they will step in, they will backstop it, and whatever you know, agency risks be damned. It's also get, hard to get the timing right. You know, there's the old quote from Paul Volcker on that when people asked him if there was going to be a recession with his tightening in 1981. And he said, you know, he thought there would be, but his comment was pick a, there's an unappreciated maxim in the economic forecasters toolkit that is too often ignored. Pick a number or pick a date, but never both. And that's something that people yeah. don't listen to enough. It's hard to get the timing, even if you get that direction right. Yeah. And I mean, I even look at inflation in the last few years, right? I mean, I, there's lots of listeners on this podcast who will re clearly remember either hearing or saying the word transitory for yeah for most of 2021, right? And, uh, you know, like, what do you what do you think about that when you look back at that now? So, you know, that's one thing. I, I was pretty early in the process, but I did write a paper at the time that this does look a lot like 1919 and 1920. And I wasn't emphatic enough because I believed the Fed, but that lasted for two years. It, you know, it was temporary, but it wasn't transitory. And that is a very good comparable for what's happening right now because they're the same underlying drivers. You have you have a lot of pent up. You had a lot of pent up savings in 1919 because people were rationing during the war. And even though it was illegal to publicize that th there was a pandemic, people knew that. I mean, you know, a lot of their neighbors were getting sick and dying. So there was a lot of, there, there was pulling back on spending. And then the second wave of the great influenza ad, ended at the end of 1918 and World War I ended at the, at the end of 1918 with the armistice. I think it was November 11th or November 13th. I forget which. I think it was November 11th. And all of a sudden that, that, that started getting spent and that drove inflation up to higher levels. Now there was inflation during the war too, but that drove inflation up to higher levels. And you also had supply chain disruptions because the war ended not only there are some funny things that you read newspapers from back then and censorship you weren't allowed to talk about the pandemic but you would see it in the advertisements there's this advertisement from at&t saying please don't call we don't have any operators so you, you know because of the pandemic so it was kind of like sneaking it in so you know you had some major supply chain disruptions from the pandemic more importantly 
the entire world was switching from a war, a total war basis back to a peacetime economy. So, you know, that, that, that requires retooling. It requires shifting labor. So it was, the, it was the same exact dynamic. The inflation lasted for about two years. The Fed was a little late in tightening. But when they tightened, they went really hard. So in January 1920, they raised rates in one session by 100, or one meeting by 125 basis points, and then again by another 100 basis points in June, and the economy went off the cliff as a result. And this, you know, this is a good example of the warning of pick a number or pick a date, never both. I, I thought there'd be a recession last year because that's what happened in really at the end of 1920. But you know, there's just so much stimulus entered into the economy that it's taken longer to drain it out. But you know, that's a good example where you had a good comparable, but it, it didn't pan out the same way. Inflation's almost gone up for three years now in the United States in, in the aftermath of COVID-19. Did anything surprise you in your research? The deficits surprised me. I, you know, we've had this mentality that deficits don't matter as long as the economy grows, you know, with it or in, in excess of it. And, and that's just not how debt was viewed before the Great Depression and World War II. And that was pretty eye opening. I never knew that. We're just, uh, we're recording a few days after International Women's Day here, Mark, as you know. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about Hetty Green. Yeah. So in terms of the, the most interesting life story, that was clearly the the standout. So very few people know the name Hetty Green. She was a, an amazing investor that lived during the Gilded Age in the early in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s. And she was, in, in my opinion, the best investor in U.S. financial history. It seemed like every time there a panic hit, 1873, 1884, 1885, I think it was 1884, 1893, 1907, she was always prepared. And she, every attribute you would want to see in a good investor, she seemed to naturally possess. She was very thrifty. So panics didn't scare her because her living expenses were next to zero. She was amazing at due diligence. Back then, the name of the game was mostly manipulating the market and insider trading. And people on Wall Street would, you know, make millions and lose it. She just, kind of waited for securities to be undervalued, bought them, and waited till they were overvalued and sold them and always had sufficient cash to manage panic. So the greatest story that just is to her credit is, you know, she wasn't allowed to have a, a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. She wasn't allowed to have a seat on a corporate board. And, you know, women were not in finance back then. And when the panic of 1907 hit, uh, J.P. Pratt Morgan would assemble during the most acute phases of the panic would assemble finan the leading financiers of the trusts and the banks in New York in his library. And Hetty Green was there too. So she was the only woman invited to those meetings because she had cash. She had actually lent a million dollars to to allow the New York City to function. They were running out of money. And she was just a, a, an incredible untold story that is so appropriate on to, to retell during Women's History Month because most people don't realize that I would argue the best investor in history was actually a woman and nobody even knows her name. It's, it's amazing. That is, that is amazing. That's a really cool story. Thanks for, thanks for telling that and for writing about it. Yeah, no problem. So, so Mark, how can they, our history help us, man? I'm just thinking about how we can apply this, right? So one, one of the things that I, I look at and we talk a lot about it, you know, on and off on, the, on this show is, is the, the crypto space. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've had some of the crypto organizations are calling for regulation. How can like a look back at our history help us sort of navigate where we are in the evolution of crypto within the backdrop of that history? So crypto is a weird one because usually when you see speculative type assets, it's it's some new innovation. You know, like the dot com bubble is a good example. AI, I would argue that, you know, obviously it's real. There are real benefits here, but. Every company now is claiming that they're AI enabled. So there's there's some there's probably some overvaluation going on there. But crypto's weird in that it's arguably a new currency. I would disagree with that, but that that's the argument. And you, you know, it's it's hard to find a comparable. I mean, the best comparable I can find is more in the area of decentralized finance. So people often don't realize that one of the purposes of a central bank is to create uniformity in the value of the currency. So back in the 1800s, you didn't have that. You had state banks who had gold and silver as reserves, and they would issue banknotes 
but those banknotes wouldn't, they were denominated in dollars. But if you, you know, had a banknote issued in Nashville or something like that, or, or I don't know, pick, pick a location and you tried to deposit it in a bank in New York, it wouldn't be worth that much because they didn't know the strength of the bank that was issuing it. So decentralized finance reminds me of the wildcat banking days in the 1800s. I think the other thing that's interesting to, I, I don't think cryptocurrency is going to, is going to have staying power. Is there a limited case usage? Sure. I mean, there's certainly one in the black market, which is not exactly an admirable use of it, but it just, I don't see central bank holding crypto in reserve anytime soon. And I, I think that would be critical. I mean, Ecuador does it, but I'm talking about like big developed economies. I, I just don't see that lasting, but it's hard to find a comparable because it is unique in, in the sense that it's almost like, you know, digital gold, but I, I just don't think it will maintain its value. And the decentralized finance is very dangerous. So what happened with FTX is what you would expect in a decentralized finance system. Yeah, there's no oversight, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that they're asking for regulation. That reminds me of the investment companies. In, the 1940 Act actually passed really fast. And the reason is not because politicians wanted to regulate the, the investment companies. The reason is the investment companies wanted to be regulated because they saw how the Securities Act of 1933 increased sales of securities. So they wanted regulation, which was not really going to change much of their practices anyway, because the really bad investment companies got wiped out in the in the Great Depression. They wanted regulation as a stamp of approval. And my, my instinct is that that is what crypto wants too. They want to be regulated, not because you know, they want to behave better. They want, they want legitimacy. Yeah. And I guess the ability to issue ETFs is sort of a step in that direction for yeah. them. Yeah. Sort of an implicit step from the SEC. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see that play out. I'll, uh, we'll have to have a, a recap call in a year or two and see where we see where we are with, with all of that. Cause, uh, I'll take the under on it. Yeah. There are definitely, it's, it, it can be, it can. I'm going on the record as taking the under on it. I don't think it's going to last. <laughs> it does. I'll, I'll admit I was wrong. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I'm curious how how this experience has might have changed kind of how you view your your work or your work advising clients or I guess put another way how readers of this book might take what they might take away to their day to day practices of investing and managing those client relationships. You know, I, I think the two as an advisor, I think the the main value proposition. A lot of mistakes are made in extreme markets when there's a panic. There's a people want to sell and get out at exactly the wrong time. And when there's a mania, they want to get in at the wrong time. And by understanding financial history, it's easier to spot these things and to use appropriate comparables to calm people down and helping them to avoid making that mistake. So that's number one. Number two is just really appreciating your limits. There's, if you look over the past 50 years, there's been this march to greater complexity in, in, and I work with institutions, so this is really more, well, it applies to individuals, but I'm just less familiar with it. There's been this march toward more complexity in portfolios, especially in alternative assets, asset classes like hedge funds and venture capital and buyout funds and now private credit. These are expensive and it's very hard to be successful with it. And knowing that my hope would be that institutions are more thoughtful about whether they have the capabilities to succeed in these areas before they make the leap. Because just leaping in is not going to, is definitely not going to ensure success. And a lot of people, I think this stems from looking at Yale and, and the publication. When, when David Swenson published his book on the success of the Yale strategy, a lot of people assume that you can just invest in alternative asset classes without having the proper infrastructure to do it right in a sustainable way, that, that that's all you needed to do. And that's that's just not what that book was saying. And, and David Swenson came out later and said, look, most institutions, you, you do have this strategy that can outperform, but the vast majority of institutions are just not equipped to do it. So I think real, this book will help people, I hope, realize their limitations and start pulling back from that complexity that's not paying off. Yeah, and you're even—I mean, you're even seeing that complexity when you talk about the Yale model and and privates, and you're seeing that. I, I feel like I'm seeing it increasingly in places that you wouldn't expect it, like in private client portfolios in large allocations, which is a bit scary to me, honestly. Yeah, it is. It's scary to me too. Yeah. All right. Well, we're coming to unfortunately to the end of our time here. I've got a bunch more questions, but I'm um, 
cognizant of our of our listeners' time. And and before I before I ask your last question, I'm going to just do a shout out to our listeners in Nashville. We love you in Nashville, and we we will take your dollars. <laughs> I, that was a random comment on Nashville. Yeah. Uh, so, and I, <laughs> Got no problem with Nashville. with Nashville. It's just the bigger point is a bank in one state wouldn't necessarily recognize the par value of you know, a, a dollar in another state. It has yeah, nothing yeah. to do with, with any I know. I know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, take you back to your first job in the industry and go back there and think about your first day in that role. If you could take yourself for coffee, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? I mean, it's self-serving, but if you're going to focus on the long term, you're better off focusing on the long term going backwards in order to see forward and in the present more clearly what's happening. I mean, that's why I wrote this book is because after studying financial history, in retrospect, I wish I had done that up front because you can see things much more clearly in the present and you can't forecast the future. Nobody can forecast the future precisely, but you can see kind of the basic shapes of what is most likely to come and a good we don't have to go into the details but it paid off during covid you know understanding that when the fed said they're going to tighten they meant business because if you understood the great inflation you knew what the risk was so that that's really the value and, and i i just think i mean i know it's biased but i just think it's it's time very well spent reading about what's happened before if you want to know what's potentially going to happen in the future I've been speaking today with Mark Higgins, author of Investing in U.S. Financial History, Understanding the Past to Forecast the Future. Thanks so much, Mark, for this book and for speaking with me today about it. Thank you, Mike. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this is me, The Enterprising Investor. 